Hi all, my name is Kelsey and I manage events and programming at RISE New York. RISE created by Barclays is a global community of the world's top innovators working together to create the future of financial services. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this event. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our moderator, Ramona, and speakers, Janae, Mike, and Max. I appreciate your hard work and dedication throughout the planning of this event. Now I'll pass the microphone to kick off the discussion. Um, first, by starting with introductions, I'm gonna pass off to Ramona. I just wanna remind everyone to um, make sure you're muted throughout the discussion um, to avoid background noise. We will send a follow-up email. So if you have any questions for our moderator or speakers, um, please feel free to send an email to us. And I hope you all enjoy. Ramona, passing to you. Thank you, Kelsey, and super excited to be here. I want to say thank you to you and Jonathan and Alexandra and the rest of the RISE team, not only for organizing this amazing event, you do such a great job, but during the last year, you guys were so supportive of the startup and a small business um, community. And maybe you don't know how much you have impacted us, but I was so impressed by everything that you guys did. And I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. My name is Ramona Cedeno. I am a CPA, a certified financial planner, have a bunch of certifications in finance and accounting. I'm a finance, accounting, numbers fanatic. And technology is my second passion. Uh, my company is Fibric. We provide accounting and fractional CFO services to startups and small businesses, uh, taking the pain out of your hands and just making sure that you have the financial information that you need to run and grow your businesses. And I am so happy to have met Janae, Max, and Mike because they have a great, uh, great experience in this space, helping small business owners and startups and entrepreneurs with uh, you know, navigating funding and cash flows and, and just helping them grow the business. And you're going to learn so much about what they do and what resources you can access through their companies and the information that they're going to share that I'm looking forward to your feedback at the end through Kelsey. Uh, I'm going to uh, let Janine introduce herself and tell us a little bit about her and her company and how she's working with entrepreneurs and small business owners uh, in the uh, managing resources and, and capital during these difficult times. Janae. Thank you, Ramona. Hi, my name is Janae Fortier, and I'm Director of Grants Administration for Hello Alice. We are a small business seeking to help support other small businesses, um, particularly those founded by women and minorities. Um, in the in the grant sphere, what what I do and what really what is driving our mission at Hello Alice is trying to support um, access and sort of unlocking capital in the form of grants for small businesses and ensuring that they're distributed equitably. So we work with a lot of our enterprise partners, some of the larger businesses who are seeking to give back to the community. Um, and, and so that's how we build grant programs with them and then distribute that funding, funding in a way that, that is in line with our mission and, um, and the mission of those companies. Thank you, Janae. And you heard companies giving back to the small business community. So keep that in mind. Um, Max, can you introduce yourself and uh, Tell us a little bit about your company and how you work with small businesses and entrepreneurs today. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everyone. Great to meet you virtually. Uh, my name is Max Frischman. I'm the director of sales for Eagle Point Funding. Um, our company works with tech startups in the United States to help them access different federal R&D grants from the various federal agencies. Um, that's what I do full time. And on the side, I advise and I consult uh, different startups and different tech companies um, to help them take them process through it from A to Z. So yeah, that's that's the one of the many hats that I wear. Thank you, Max. Mike, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about you? Mike, I'm, I'm president and uh, co-founder at Fundica. So it's an award-winning online funding tool is set up in Canada and is now started as well in the US. I'm also president of R&D Partners, which is a leading R&D funding consultancy. So we help 
uh, like very companies, some very small companies, some medium ones, some very large ones, identify the different funding available out there. And in the case of Fundico, we really we have a solution that we white label and sell to governments, banks, and other uh, entrepreneur supporting organizations so that they can help their clients uh, identify available funding out there. Thank you, Mike. And and although the topic today is navigating U.S. grants and, and private grants, we will talk about other uh, sources of financing like tax credits, believe it or not, it, Uncle Sam is, is sometimes generous to us, uh, tax credits and other loan options that might be available, uh, how to apply for those and really get, a, get access to that, those capital. Uh, Max, I want to start with you uh, because during the last few, the last 12 months now or more, um, small business owners and entrepreneurs and founders of startups uh, struggled sometimes with applying to different grants, private, um, public, what do I qualify for? Can you tell us a little bit about the difference between private and public grants and, and whether a public funding and whether there is a disadvantage or an advantage by going from one to the other or choosing one versus the other? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. Um, and I think it's a beautiful question to, to really lead off this conversation with. Um, in terms of the difference between private versus public funding, um, there's a lot. OK, but I would never, ever recommend for any company to just choose one or the other, because to be honest with you, they very much go hand in hand. Um, the biggest difference that I can really talk about um, between going after federal R&D grants versus going the private sector and going after, let's say, VC funding or, or angel funding um, is a, three big things. The first is the equity. OK, with VCs. Uh, typically in the private funding, you're, you're giving up equity, right? Whereas federal R&D grants, it doesn't necessarily require you to give up any equity of your company. The second big part is really who is being added into your company, whether you like it or not. When you're talking about the private funding, angels, VCs, um, a lot of times it comes with outside advisors or board members being added into the company, additional decision makers. Whereas federal R&D grants, you don't have that either from the federal agencies that you're applying to and winning. Um, and then the last thing, I think that this is the most important thing, especially when you're talking to tech companies themselves, is the IP. Now, when you are working with VCs, private funding, sometimes it does require you to give up some of your IP and some transfer of the IP. But with federal R&D grants, there's no IP transfer that is required. So I think that those are the, really the biggest three things that you can touch on what the difference is, whether it's a benefit or, or, or not um, between the, the two types of funding sources. Thank you, Max. That's very, very helpful. Do you find that also one of the things to consider is how long you have been in business? So maybe for U.S. grants, you must be in business X number of years or months versus like we saw with the IDO loans and the PPP loans, you had to be in business by X date. But with VC funding, you might get a, an investor to invest in you when you have an idea, right? Yeah, I, I think it really depends, first off, if you're talking about private and the amount of capital that you're raising and the round that you're raising, it depends on uh, kind of what you've done in the past up until that point and when you're going to ask for funding. Um, but in terms of going after federal grants, listen, at the end of the day, they don't care if the company's been around for two months and you're working out of mom and dad's basement and two people large, or if you're a 500 plus person enterprise. Um, what it really matters and boils down to in terms of in terms of public funding from the federal R and D grants is the technology. It's they invest in the best technology. It doesn't matter how long you've been around. Doesn't matter about how much money you've raised, whether or not you have a proof of concept or a commercially viable product. They want the best technology. Yes, thank you, Max. Uh, Mike, so I know your company helps uh, put up on founders with navigating the tax credits. Tell us about some of the tax credits that uh, startups can have access to, uh, which ones are the ones that are giving you the biggest dollars versus not, and which ones are the ones that startups are going after the most. Sure. So in terms of on the federal side, there's obviously the federal R&D tax credit, which was improved in the U.S. 
there's now a refundable portion. Uh, it is limited, but it is something uh, it's, that's interesting. Uh, and then you kind of go state by state. Um, so in the state of New York, there's a good, the Excelsior program is pretty good. It's good for R&D projects, job creation, and investment. And then across other states, there's other tax credits. It's very specific state to state in, in terms of what's being offered. Um, but what I would really recommend is that you really identify what is available in your area, be it tax credits or grants, and then find what is the most relevant for you. A little bit going on with Max said, depending on your actual situation, how you would fit in. So if you have really great technology and it's about R&D, then they're, you know, go take a good look at what the grants are for there, look at the tax codes for there. If you're really going, kind of providing, it for, providing a solution that maybe uh, would fit into other grants or tax credits, then be careful about those, but go into the which ones, you know, apply to, to what you're doing. Thank you, Mike. And what is that uh, your firm, Frandica, helps startups apply for some of these credits? What is that process like to, for the R&D especially? Sure. So when you go into Fundica, it's, it's a free service, first of all, for entrepreneurs. You go in and you'll identify your core profile. So tell us about where you're based, when you started, the industries you're in, um, and the kind of size of the company based on revenue based on our employees at the stage you're at. So identify a few things. And then as we go along, we'll try and ask for other information as well. So we can get an even better idea of the profile of the company and the needs of it. And then based on that and using AI, we'll come out and recommend these are the top brands. These are the top tax credits. And these are the top loan guarantees. Other government programs as well would come out. So we're really going to provide those. The more information we collect in the company, the better we'll be able to come back and tell the company what's available. Um, so that's the solution. We've currently, over the years, we've done um, we've, hundreds of millions of dollars have gone through there. It's been a lot in Canada. And more recently, we've now opened the site up in the U.S. Uh, and we're currently starting to work with some partners there. Uh, so it's, it's a free service. It's an easy one. And the biggest thing I would say with grants and tax credits is identifying the right ones and not wasting your time in the wrong places. And then obviously validating that you've actually picked the right one. So this is one tool that could help. Thanks, Mike. And um, if you're not profitable, you can use the R&D tax credits to offset payroll taxes. So keep that in mind. Once you're profitable, then you can offset, uh, use the credit to offset your income tax liability. So although you, you know, if you're not pro if you're losing a ton of money, but you're spending a ton in R&D, this, this might be a good option for you for um, cash flow uh, from a cash flow perspective. So keep that in mind. Exactly, Roma. That's exactly how it works and, and, and well said. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Janae, um, I am a huge fan of Hello Alice. I already mentioned that some of my peer business owners use the platform and have gotten funded through the platform, some of the programs that you guys have uh, sponsored. And I know that the uh, organization is very focused on increasing access to capital for minority-owned businesses. Close to my heart. Thank you for that. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you find uh, this this group of business owners and the minority groups uh, are encountering when they are trying to access capital? And what can we do more of to help them get more access as a community? Thanks, Ramona. I would say that some of the largest challenges that women and minority business owners face really mirror the, the systemic issues um, that we see in our society, which is representation. So even though, you know, business owners um, that are female identifying or people of color are, is growing exponentially, we don't see that same rate of growth when we're looking at um, representation in grant funding, lending and investing. So just a few years ago, for example, only 2.2% of all venture capital went to female founded startups, um, even though we, we know that we're getting closer to 40% of startups that are female founded, right? And so that happens for a couple of reasons, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think, um, so one of them, for example, is that venture capitalists tend to invest in startups run by people of their own tribe in a sense. So if they are all Stanford educated white men, there's a good chance that they're going to be their affinity for and what they're going to fund is other uh, Stanford educated white men. Um, and so because only I think we're 
that's about 6% of venture capital firms these days are female founded, you can see that there's there's not as much opportunity in that sense for women to also be represented when it comes to, um, to investing. And then the other challenge that we see often is that women have a tendency to start businesses that don't make as much revenue as, as men do, right? We're looking at the healthcare or um, wellness, um, personal services and professional services. And so because most investors are looking for businesses that can grow to be, you know, a billion dollars or more, um, that's just not the vast majority of female founded businesses. Um, I think it's, I read recently that 90% of female owned businesses are solopreneurs um, and, and less than 6% of women owned firms are generating revenues of more than $250,000. So what we can do as a community is really focus on ensuring that uh, that we're removing those barriers so it, like what i do in my role is really talk to some of our partners um, about these inequities and ways that we can combat them so ensuring that our at least on the grant funding side if we don't need to put a box around the amount of revenue generated, then then let's not. Let's think about why we're doing that and the impact that that's going to have on who's applying to our grants. We also pay very careful attention to the demographics of our applicant pool and make sure that our recipient pool is, is an equitable match. So if 50% of all applicants are female, then there's no reason why at least 50% of our recipients can't also be female. We want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to, to receive the funding that they're applying for. Um, so as a community, we can continue to advocate for and sunshine these issues. And if you're in a funding role to really ensure that you're paying careful attention to where your money is going. Thank you, Janae. That's very, very helpful. And I think that I, I also noticed, and, and I would like to get your insights on this, that sometimes maybe there is a lack of information getting to this group, so they are not reaching out for the support in some cases. Do you notice that too? Oh, absolutely. A lot of, if we're talking about, you know, smaller businesses with, with really low profit margins, probably don't have a huge presence on social media or aren't super active in, in other spaces where a lot of people are and are finding these opportunities. And so, you know, for a lot of Hello Alice um, outreach, when we're, we're looking at how did you hear about this grant, so much of it is word of mouth. Um, and so it's it's really about, uh, obviously COVID changed a lot. There's not as much door to door and you know, knocking that you can do anymore. And I think we're getting back to that place. Um, but when we're, some of these solopreneurs or, or folks are starting multiple, um, um, companies are also moms are also, you know, living and taking care of multiple generations in one household. No one has time to sit there and scroll through, you know, LinkedIn or, or Instagram or wherever these things are popping up. Um, and so it's really about word of mouth. And so it, it's thinking creatively on our end, the onus is on us to ensure that we are doing everything in our power to ensure we're reaching our core audience and the people that, that we want to find these opportunities and making that easier. So making sure that you can apply on your phone, um, that you that there is a person that you can reach out to and ask questions to and talk to. Um, I think we're going to try to do more community outreach forums so that we have opportunities to help walk folks through some of these grant applications to make it easier, more accessible, um, and not as daunting of a task. Thank you, Janae. And I, I want to acknowledge that there are, there are a lot of organizations um, helping in, in that area. And I think we're making a, a lot of changes. So looking forward to more. Um, thank you. I During the last, I, I, can, I, I can't believe it's, a, it's been a year already, but I noticed that a lot of business owners, the ones coming to us and just through conversations uh, with uh, peer accountants and CPAs, a lot of business owners struggled uh, during the application process for private um, government grant, even alone with the bank. And a lot of it was lack of preparation, lack of planning, and also um, not being able, getting overwhelmed by an application. Either they didn't have the experience, they didn't have the support from uh, an outside advisor. But the process was so daunting that a lot of them, uh, a lot of them ended up not getting the funds that they could have gotten. Some of it free, right? And it's a shame. Uh, I would like to ask Max uh, to talk, tell us a little bit about 
How, what do you see in the space when you are helping small business owners get funding? What was that application process like uh, for private and, and uh, uh, public grants? Matt? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, now, my expertise specifically with my day job lies in the public grants. But the first half of what I'm going to say, it has to do with both. Um, and kind of, you know, uh, the first part of the two part answer for this is navigation and identification. You have to know where to look and how to look because just like everyone was saying, there are thousands and thousands of app opportunities out there and they're not necessarily all on one portal. And when, even when you're talking about finding, you know, I have X, Y technology, I think it would be a great fit for the army, but we're not just talking about the army. There are 15 agencies underneath the army all of them with hundreds of opportunities. And then you think you found the one that you like, you click on it, and all of a sudden it's a 500 page document with 150 different grant opportunities in it. So being able to really navigate the system to identify all the relevant opportunities for your company, your technology, your R&D roadmap, use cases, whatever you may have, that's the first half of the most important part. The second half, it kind of goes back into what Janae was saying in her last answer. And it was all about knowing your audience. So in terms of public grant application process, you have to understand who you're applying to, right? In the application itself, what you're writing, because you can have, you can find all the most relevant opportunities that fit you, but you might not be the best storyteller or you might be the best storyteller, but not find all the opportunities. You have to have both. So knowing your audience in terms of who you're actually writing the application and applying to, you know, keywords that Department of Homeland Security wants to see versus what National Science Foundation wants versus what NASA wants, completely different. So knowing how to tell your story, knowing how to paint your picture, that's really what it comes down to. Because at the end of the day, you're selling yourself, your tech, and painting the picture of how that agency can use your technology within themselves. So it's, it's kind of a two-part question that and you have to have them both. Thank you, Max. What are some of the public grants that you uh, that you have or other programs that you have helped your clients with recently? Just a few, two or three. The biggest wow. Ones. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right, so these are the freebies that, that I can give everyone. <laughs> um, honestly, an, a program that is very, very much relevant, I would probably say that I'm a betting man. I would say that 90% of people, if they would go on and look afterwards, they would probably be able to find a public R&D grant that's probably relevant for their company, their tech, uh, their R&D roadmap, something from the National Science Foundation. Um, what the National Science Foundation is looking for is they don't know what they're looking for. Okay. Why do I say it like that? They have, I think it's 19, 20 different focus areas as broad as AI. Right. But what they're really looking for companies to come to them is this is who we are. This is what we have. This is what we want to do. And here is how the U.S. economy society uh, can benefit from it. So that's a great, great program. And then there's a bunch of programs that, that we work with on a, on a week to week basis from the Department of Defense. Um, as I was saying at the beginning, before everyone joined, in terms of where we've had success, um, it's virtually every agency that you can think of other than NIH and HHS, um, which are the National Institute of Health, Human Health Services. Why haven't we had success with it? Eagle Point, my company, doesn't deal with life sciences. Our sister company deals with life sciences. So it's all about the company and their technology, and you have to find the relevant agencies and opportunities. But don't limit yourself with just one agency. You typically find one, and it's very much applicable to multiples. Thank you, Max. And you mentioned something that made me think of uh, uh, another thing that I wanted to mention before. The R&D credit is not limited to technology companies. It's, it, it can be a new process, a new product, a new something. So look into it, uh, even yeah. if you're not in tech. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's one of those things that's out there for people to use. They have this money. They want to give it away. They virtually are marketing themselves to make sure that companies are applying and using this money. So there's no reason that you should hear online or go on LinkedIn and see your competitor winning this money because that typically means that it, 
any company says I have the best technology or else that company wouldn't exist. So be the ones to find it before them. Very good, very good tip. Um, Janae, what are some tips that we can share with the audience that can help them uh, make this application process easier for the some of the grants that Hello Alice makes available or in general for other um, programs that you might know? I wanted to build a little on what Max was saying earlier around being able to tell your story. If you're looking at um, public funding, federal and state grant opportunities, um, you also have to be an incredible type A project coordinator because it is an extensive amount of work for all of the attachments that were required, every bit of information that they're looking for. So my tip is more broad, which is really about being strategic when you're thinking about private and public funding. Um, like Max said, that you, you absolutely, it's not a, an, an, an either or, it's go after all, but remember that public or federal or state funding um, has, has a little accountability um, um, asterisk after it, right? So you are not signing, you're not just sending an application and you're gonna get a buttload of money. You are signing up for work for one, two, three years, right? So be very careful and strategic about which perhaps one federal grant that you're going after. And once you, after you've dedicated your time to filling out the application, um, every single teeny tiny detail, then, you know, throw the spaghetti at the wall for private funding. Um, go after every single, you know, um, e easy. At, at, if you filled out a federal grant, then everything after theirs is going to feel very easy. Um, so if you go after like a National Science Foundation grant and then come to Hello Alice and fill out an application, you know, you could do that in your sleep. So I would say that my number one tip is be strategic. Go after one, maybe two federal, state, government grants that are clearly aligned with your mission and what you're wanting to do. Remember to, no matter how tedious or ridiculous it might seem, if they tell you to repeat the same thing over and over again, you do it. Um, and, and remember that you are going to have to submit uh, receipts so that they will reimburse you for the work that you've done. You will have to submit status reports, um, both narrative and probably quantitative. Um, so remember that, that a lot of work is following. It is not just a one and done. Uh, and then and then after that, or in conjunction with, apply for every private grant that you can possibly find. Thank you, Janine. And, and one thing that I advise my clients and that we do for ourselves is to have a repository of documents that you're going to reuse on a regular basis for these applications. You can take a few hours to do this, or you can have one of your, your staff members or get an intern who can help you set this up. You have this one folder where you have your articles of incorporation, your tax return from the last three years, whatever it is that is going to be reusable, have it there. And then the process to apply on an ongoing basis is going to be easier. And you can apply to more back to you have chosen them strategically you, and you want to apply to more than one or two grants or loans, you have all these documents there and anyone from your team can do the initial network so that you can save that time. So that's my little tip there. Um, Mike, do, you know, Fundica is a free resource, it's online. Um, I, I love online applications. I love doing everything on the web. I don't want to walk into any bank or talk to people on the phone, no. So I'm all about tech. But do you find that there is still a large group of sm small business owners or entrepreneurs that want to go the traditional route and apply by talking to someone on the phone or walking into a branch for a loan or a grant? So very good question, Ramona. So <clears throat> I would say um, to kind of follow on with Max and Renee, um, I think you have to be very smart or strategic, I guess is the word that Janae used. Uh, the first thing is to identify. So really to, uh, to use tools like what we have, what's out there to identify. And I would say the best way to do that is definitely online, uh, you know, filter down to what makes the most sense for you. Um, it may also be talking to advisors like Max or me as well and trying to figure out, okay, what are the best programs out there? But I would really be very strategic in identifying the best ones. Then I would go in 
validate that. And be it a digital or online application, or be it a kind of more traditional, you fill out the paperwork, I would still encourage people to validate that. So either with the granting agency or with an advisor, you know, don't go and fill out all this paperwork for nothing when, you know, the program actually has no more money left in it, or, you know, you're filling it out a certain way and you don't understand that actually what they're really looking for is something a little different. So I would always suggest, even if you use, you know, Fundica or any other tool to then validate the programs that are there. And then in validating them, you'll also rank them. So as they had said, like pick the one or two that really make the most sense. So go with those programs. programs. And then when you come to the application, you don't necessarily get the choice. I think more and more of these applications are coming online. You kind of have to go with the way they've set it up, the way they wanted to do it. Uh, some of them are very quirky, some very antiquated systems. Um, but you do the absolute best you can. You do that kick-ass application. You really have to nail it. Uh, I think you know Janae said that well, and Max said in a different way. You got to understand what they want. You got to tell your story. You really, really got to do it. Doing it halfway is not. You might as well not even do it. Do it really properly. Do it all the right way. Bring in additional help. Uh, you know, bring it. You know, interns, Ramon, like you mentioned, or kind of file systems to kind of online to manage it. But make sure you have a process in place so you get a kick-ass you know, application out there. So for me, the kind of steps that are important are. You know, identify it, then validate it, then apply properly. I think entrepreneurs, it's the governments who are really deciding how the application process goes. It's getting easier in theory, um, but you kind of have to work with what you have. And I, I think people are preferring, I think I prefer the, the online, um, but as long as it's clear. Sometimes even the online forms are not clear. Um, so it's really the clarity of what comes down, the, what's requested. Uh, that it matters, but going through those steps is, is the way. Thank you, Mike. That's very helpful. And and it's interesting that you say, uh, well, I expected you to say that, but it's still interesting to see that people don't always follow the being careful with the application process and paying attention to the details. And during this, uh, the, this time, so when we were applying to the PPP loan and the IDLE and the forgiveness, I was amazed by how many returned applications were received from the, the small amount of business owners that we help. Um, and we weren't the one applying so but They were applying and they were coming back to us like, oh, the, my application was rejected because I miscalculated something. Uh, a multiplication on the forgiveness form. And it just, it's just such a waste of time and resources, right? Whereas if you just focus <laughs> and follow each step and review before submission, you can save yourself a lot of time and money, potentially. Yes, these are competitive situations, so you really have to do, you know, get that kick-ass application in as do yes. exactly what you're saying. Yes, thank you. Max, you have two jobs, two work for two companies. You founded some startups before um, your current roles. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you find early stage Sort of founders encounter when trying to get funded and uh does it get better as time goes on tell us about your experience for yourself and for the people that you work with yeah it's a uh, listen that's just what's on my linkedin in terms of what i do it's far beyond that but it's an <laughs> awesome it's, a, it's an awesome it, you know there's 24 hours in a day so i try to fit everything in but the capital is the the million dollar question hopefully for most companies more than a million dollar question um you have to be proactive with it, okay? A lot, be, raising money is a full-time job, okay? So in terms of spending time, and when you're talking about the earlier the company, it means the less people you have, the less bandwidth that you have. So you have to make sure that every single dollar that you raise, you are using it appropriately. However, the further on your company gets, the more money that you get, and probably the, the, the more diluted that you get, you have more money to try a bunch of different things. Um, but in terms of the challenges, you have to stay ahead of it. If you think that you need $1 million and that's gonna take you eight months because you've done all these calculations, you should probably raise $1.2 million because that will give you an extra two months buffer, right? In terms of when to raise that next round, you should start as soon as you're done raising that first round. 
not necessarily going out and making connections, but developing a plan. Because again, raising capital is honestly a full-time job and you just have to make sure that you have enough runway to get you where you want to go and be on that. Um, so in terms of, you know, I, I'm helping one of my companies right now, they're doing a seed round at a million dollars. And they said, we want to raise $500,000 for, for a year long. And we had this long conversation between me, lawyers, them, and we really figured out that $500,000, yeah, it looks like it will take them a year. But when it's a five person team and they're trying to develop a hardware and software, well, when will they have time in six months from now, eight months to now, raise that next round? So ask for more money, but make sure that you're being very, very smart. And that's really the second part is in terms of taking money, there are two people that you can take money from. You can take money from someone that's just going to give you the money and be silent. Okay. Fine, that works for some people. Or you can take strategic money. And in my mind, it is always better to take strategic money. Why? Because that person that's giving you money is going to help propel you along further than that person that's just staying silent and giving you and writing blank checks. Okay, it is always better. And again, I'm not, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not giving anyone financial advice. And that goes for anything that I said before and, and later. But be very, very smart with who you take money from. And it should be from people that are going to help your business, not just write you checks. That's a very good point, Max, because one of the reasons to get VC investors is to get that advisory, additional advice where you can get mentoring. Uh, yes, they can be, you know, <laughs> they can be you know, demanding, yeah. but at the end you get you get a lot more than just the cash. And I think that for scaling startups, that is so important. It's the same thing, Ramona. It's the same thing with winning money from grants, from federal R&D grants. Why is it smart? Yeah, you're getting, uh, you know, $100,000, then almost a million dollars for the R&D project that you probably would have to spend your own money on before, that's great. Don't get me wrong. When you're talking about non-dilutive capital, any smart business owner knows that that's where I want to go and try to get from. But in terms of federal R&D grants, it's the long play with it. Why? It's very, very strategic. The vast majority of the times, putting National Science Foundation aside because they could care less about being an end user of the technology. But let's talk about the DOD. They're not investing in your company out of the kindness of your out of the kindness of their heart. They're investing in your company and technology because they want to be an end user of it. So what you're actually going to see from them is far beyond that million dollars of non-dilutive funding that they're giving for your R&D. You have the potential for them to become a client of yours. And that by far is worth way more than the million dollars that you're going to get from them in grants. But you have to get the grant before you can get the procurement. Right. <laughs> exactly. You have to work for the money. And you mentioned cash runway. I love that KPI or that tracking. So that's how much, how long your cash, your reserve of cash is going to last you. How many months, right? That's how I define it. <laughs> I love that. Um, great. Thank you, Max. Mike, uh, Max touched on uh, equity financing a little bit. Uh, what are some of the trends that you see today with uh, VC investors, angel investors? Are they being more cautious, taking longer to make decisions? because of the pandemic and the financial crisis that we were going through recently? Good question, Rowena. So the first thing I would say, I, I'll get into that, that question, but the first thing I'd like to say is with a lot of entrepreneurs, especially early stage, I think there's some steps they should follow before getting to that equity. So you kind of preface that a bit. And the steps I see really in the pre-funding stage are, you know, you really want to do idea validation, market fit. You want to get a core team together. Fortunately, you need a little bit of money to go get money. So I would really focus on making sure those steps are there. And this is a little bit like Monopoly. You want to follow these steps um, in order. You can't just go all the way to go. You got to actually go around the board. So make sure to follow these steps before we do that. And then when we get into the next, we get into funding, I would start with the government funding. So the programs that, that you know, Max mentioned, the, the programs that Janae's firm offers, all the, all the kind of freer money, uh, that's out there. So the government funding and the grants. Uh, and then if you're eligible, go for loans. Loans aren't going to work for everybody. Uh, you're going to need some cash flow or you're going to need some assets uh, to go for those. And then the last and least would be the equity one. So I'll kind of get into your 
question about the equity, but I think that's really the last thing you should be looking at. So for entrepreneurs, it's very important to follow those steps. And I think that is one of the biggest mistakes entrepreneurs make is not following those steps. So if you get into equity today, VCs are doing great. It's one of the greatest periods ever. I think COVID has actually helped a lot. It's made a lot of firms, uh, the demand for online services for next generation technology, even more necessary. So it's really advanced all that. So it's been a great time for uh, VCs. The, the number of firms has grown. The amount invested has grown. Uh, the ability to exit has gotten much easier through either the capital, you know, the capital markets in a few different ways. So overall, it's gone well, and there is more money available in the equity market and in the VC market than I think there's, there's ever been. Um, in terms of going to see them, I would say the same kind of story, though. Really understand which ones work for you. So there are thousands of VCs or angel investors out there. Uh, there's only certain ones that are going to invest in, let's say, uh, if, you're, if you want to do home delivery service. Well, there's, there are VCs who do that. And, and go figure out the five best ones out there. And if you find, okay, these are the five best ones out there, you actually don't want to contact them. You want to find someone who will introduce you to each one of those five. So it's a question of, again, identifying the best ones, kind of validating the best ones. And in the case of VCs, getting introductions to them, uh, to go talk to them. So um, I know I kind of prefaced that a bit, Ramona. I hope that was helpful. I think that with the VCs, uh, I hope that's clear where you know, where I think the state of it is and, you know, the way you should be working with them. Yes, no, that was very helpful. On that, and I appreciate that you mentioned that. And one thing I want to remind uh, founders and small business owners of is that if you can avoid it, don't borrow from your 401k. I don't like to see that, but I see a lot of uh, small business owners now taking money out of the 401k, borrowing or just taking distributions to invest in their businesses. And, you know, it might be that that was the last resort or just that they didn't know about this, all these other options that they have. Do you, do you, do you have any recommendations to those business owners? Yeah, certainly. You have to really make sure you're managing your overall risk properly. So, so be very careful of that. And, and I would even say, too, like in the news, we often see, you know, Facebook got, to, you know, way back in the day, got so much funding or the, the big news is the VC funding. Um, the real stories are the companies that actually don't even need to get that VC funding and are highly successful. They don't even need to maybe get, you know, loans. So the, my suggestion would be, you know, go get government loans or sorry, go get government money when it fits for you. But after that, only go get even loans from third parties if you really need it. If you don't need it, even better. To me, that's an even bigger success story. However, you won't be on the front page of, you know, Silicon Valley Daily. Uh, but I don't think at the end of the day, that's most entrepreneurs goal. It's really to build their business. So, um, so kind of, you know, be very careful about managing that risk though, taking on loans, first of all, from yourself. And secondly, even from others, uh, only do it if it's makes sense. And, um, you, know, you can see the long-term big picture out of it. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Managing that is a whole other monster that we <laughs> we can spend hours talking about right and we don't want to get you into debt that you cannot repay um Jeanne, um i this is my opinion but i think it's well known that high growth um entrepreneurs and scaling uh startups i mean have more access to equity investors right and that's just the way it is and we accept it what recommendations do you have for business owners that are not in a scaling or high growth startups uh, to get access to some equity funding or loans or grants that might not be um, that might be targeting them specifically? But first, if you don't mind, I'm going to do that thing that I hate that people do, which is I just really felt compelled to. Um, to add a comment to something that Max said earlier, because I thought it was really powerful, um, which was around if you need, you know, if you need a million to get you through the end of the year, you should be asking for 1.2 or more to give you that runway that you need. I think I think it's really important to highlight that women, and particularly women of color, undervalue themselves consistently, um, and it's because they are undervalued by society. So if you are a female. Um, or person of color in this audience trying to start a business or thinking about um, or in the process of, 
remember that. I think that that is a really critical piece at, um, that I, because it's, you know, I think women do that to themselves all the time is we think we have to justify everything that, that we're doing with cold, hard facts. And it is a fact that you need an additional couple of months of, of capital to get you to where you need to be. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that to not, con- to not undervalue yourself. If you need a million, ask for 1.2. I love that. I think that should be like a tagline somewhere. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the uh, first things that I would say is to check out local um, chambers of commerce or, or to, to connect with local business support organizations in your area. Um, for for those owners of non-scaling small businesses that are that are looking to find investors or lenders that cater to their type of companies, um, I have been one of one of the companies that we work with right now um, as a as a grant um, ad, for the, we're the grant administrator for a public utility company in Maryland, and the, I have been so impressed with the Maryland Small Business Development Center. They are stepping up in ways that I just I totally would not have expected. They got their team together. And after we um, we hosted a grant application just sort of conversation, they developed their own webinar on how to tell your story on narrative to- storytelling for this grant application. Um, so so reach out to your your local SBDCs because they're doing some incredible work. Um, another thought is that you could think about raising money through crowdfunding especially if you have a business with regular customers um, like a bar or a restaurant where there's um, where there's local buy-in and want to support what you're doing. Um, so there are crowdfunding orgs like Kiva or WeFunder that are especially for those kinds of businesses. Um, and, then, and then CDFIs, the community development financial institutions, are designed to be the middle ground between Kiva and a bank loan. Um, something else that I heard recently, too, was to um, to go to your the sort of the community impact or the neighborhood impact division of your bank, because um, especially if you're doing something hyper local and you're looking to increase business development in local neighborhoods, there are parts of um, there are arms of the banks that are super interested in and have they have their own KPIs that they need to meet right around impact. Um, and so that was a tip that I heard recently that I thought might be useful. And then finally, um, there's a chance that if you do actually need equity like capital, that you could look at revenue based financing options like the Founders First Capital Partners. And I will I will hold out myself and say that. I actually am not the expert in these things. And I 100% went to my team and Hello Alice and said, please help me. I need bullet points. So those are my Hello Alice experts speaking through me today. That you speak of all of them. So I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And the tips that you shared are just, are just right on point. Of course, your team was on. Um, here in New York, the different chambers are always promoting a grant that they are supporting or promoting on, on behalf of their partners. Uh, in Westchester, in New York, we have right now the chamber is running a program for minority owned businesses in Westchester. So yes, the chambers have a lot of access to resources and information that can help you get some additional funding. And I think that uh, Max and Mike mentioned this before, it's about doing the research and looking at for what is out there and the web has so much um, to offer. It's just taking a little bit of time and putting together a list and um, you know, applying. Uh, and you all can chime in when the, the other person speaks. Don't, you don't need to apologize. Uh, we have 10 minutes left, but yes, please do. Uh, and some of the points that we're making uh, that you guys are making are so great. And to the audience, don't you think these guys are just so awesome? Connect with them after. I really encourage you. They're just great people to have in your uh, network. Um, I am going to ask uh, each one of you to tell us a little bit about what are the biggest mistakes that you see founders and business owners make when they're seeking uh, funding? And we may have touched on this, but can we summarize this for the audience so that they can prevent those mistakes going forward? So I'm going to start with Max. Max, what do you find are the biggest mistakes they make? Okay, so I, I have two, and I don't necessarily think that they're related. Um, the first is, again, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not giving financial advice. 
Um, so take this with a grain of salt, but don't use your own money if you don't have to. Always use someone else's money if you can. That's why you typically see early stage companies. The first round is friends and family. Okay. Don't, I wouldn't recommend sinking your 401k or your entire life savings into developing your business unless you've market, you know, if you've, you've beta tested it and have market validity beforehand. Um, so just be very, very careful with what you're starting the business with, my personal opinion. Um, the second, the second point is um, I think people, and, and I'll be very honest with you, I think I had this, this, uh, this analogy wrong up until my first job out of college. Um, I used to think it was all about who you know, right? Use who you know, but it's not. It doesn't matter who you know. So you have to maximize your network. And this is why we're all here. You should all be adding us on LinkedIn. And I've seen uh, 10 connections so far add us on LinkedIn right now. But at the end of the day, it comes down to who knows you. It doesn't matter if you have Bill Gates's phone number in your phone. You can call him all you want. But unless he's going to answer the phone or call you back, then do you really know him? So be very, very, very strategic about how and who you're building your network with and always go to them as the first steps. Um, because more times than not, questions that you have, people have probably had in the past and learn from their mistakes. Let them have failed and let them give you advice. It might not work the same, but at least you'll have a better idea going forward. So money and, and network, I think that that's very, very key. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Mike, what do you want to share with the audience? All right. So great points, Max. I, I totally agree with both of those. Uh, I think I'll have two of my own, which are more or less just summarizing what I said before. First of all, on a macro level, before you go get any funding, make sure you have your idea, your market fit, get your core team together. Uh, these things don't cost any money. Or really, they should be able, you should be able to do these right up front. You need a little bit of money. Even to go get money, you need money. So make sure you have all these things in place. Otherwise, you're not going to really get very far. Then you go get government money. If you really need it, you go get those loans. If you really, really, really need it, it's going to be very expensive. It's going to be complicated. It's going to add a lot of like complexity to everything you're doing. Go get that additional kind of equity money, either in the form of VC or angel or the like. So that's my first thing. So follow the steps. Kind of think of it as a monopoly board. Go around it properly. You can't jump right to the end. Um, do that. The second thing is on a more kind of micro level, when you've actually said, okay, now I'm going to go get these government grants or these different programs, identify the best ones. That's People spend way too much time doing that. Use a tool like Fundica. It's free. Use it, you know, any other solutions out there. Identify those programs and validate them. Um, as great as they may seem on the, the web somewhere, make sure it really, really does fit. Uh, and then if you decide to go do it, apply and do it in a kick-ass way. You're, you got to really, you're, it's a competitive situation, Grants, you're really going to have to do a kick-ass way. Use external help. Use Max. Use use people that can really get you there. Um, that's, you know, if you don't have the capabilities internally. So that's, that's my suggestion. So those are my two points. Thank you, Mike. Um, Janae, what do you find are the big mistakes the small businesses um, owners make when they are applying through a Hello Alex, for example? I also have two, um, two points, sort of micro um, and macro. So First, I would say this is something we talk a lot about in the nonprofit world, which is mission drift. And I think it's applicable in the small business community as well. And when you're going after grants so um, or contracts, it's this idea of really knowing who you are, your core values and your core product. Because when you're really strapped for cash and you start, you look at a grant and you read the, the purpose and the intention and you think, well, we could probably do that. Like, yeah, we've got the time, we've got the money, we can, we'll have to fudge this thing and, you know, probably have to hire someone or do this or do this. That's mission drift. You're getting too far away from your core values and you're going to set, you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, Cause you, it's, it's really about being strategic and pointed. And I know it's tough um, because when, when you need money, you want to throw the spaghetti at the wall, um, but really think critically about why you're going after that funding and if it fits um, at a very basic level with who you are and what you're trying to do. And then, um, and then my, my micro level um, um, tip or 
advice would be, I know it sounds silly, um, but on a grant application or on a loan application, on any application, no field is not important. Think of no one single field on that form as not required. I guarantee you someone is looking at it. When I have a list of 15,000 applications in front of me, the only way that I can filter those out is by starting to eliminate people that didn't take the time to complete their application entirely. Um, so that would be my micro tip. No field is not required. <laughs> I love that. For from someone who has reviewed thousands and thousands of uh, tax returns, there is just that one box that if you don't check yes or no, it's going to mess everything else up. And it can make the difference between you getting a credit and not getting a credit. So I totally agree with you. Uh, read every single line and every single checkbox and make sure that you answer it correctly. I, I like that, Janine. <laughs> Uh, and one that I see, one mistake that I see uh, business owners make when applying for funding uh, is, is not planning how they're going to use the funds. I have prospective clients that come to me and say, I got this grant for $25,000 and I don't know how I'm going to use it. Where do I start? Uh, so a little budget, a little plan of how, what, how much you need first if you're going for, if you're actually applying for a loan or applying for a specific amount of uh, asking for equity uh, funding is knowing how you're going to use the money and then once you have it uh, using it in the way that aligns with that plan and that budget so take a little time for that we have two minutes left and <laughs> awesome I'm, I'm i didn't time myself and i didn't time the speakers this is great uh i just want to leave the audience with one uh resource uh, you know, with you, Janae, is hello, Alice. So hello, Alice, I'm, I'm going to skip you. Uh, with you, uh, Mike is Fandika. <laughs> but if you have another one to add, please do. Uh, but I'll start with Mike. And one resource for business owners can find uh, information about loans, uh, grants. And I know you mentioned that they should go into many West, uh, different sites, but do you have any recommendation for one platform that might include multiple resources? Uh, that's for you, Max. Um, Eagle Point funding. <laughs> that's, that's what we do. If I if I told you where to look, we'd be giving away our secret sauce. <laughs> Great. So, no, I I think I think that you know everyone has their own route to go down. Just don't waste time doing something that you don't know how to do. Because I guarantee that there is a company or professionals out there that can do it faster and more efficiently than you can. And you honestly don't have the time to do it if you're running a company. So be cognizant of. Thank you. Thank you, Max. That was, that was, I love it. Uh, that's great. So I'm going to let um, Kelsey close it. We have one minute. Thank you, everyone. You guys were awesome. I enjoyed this conversation. You made it so easy for me. Look forward thank to you, it. Thank you, Ramona. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know what just happened there. <laughs> Technology. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today um, and to our wonderful moderator and speakers. We will be sending up, um, sending out a follow-up email. Um, so again, if you have any questions for our speakers um, or want to connect with them, please feel free to let us know. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Yeah.